Welcome to Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah, and I'm here with Pastor Craig Roders. Hi. Our guest today is the founder and president of Turning Point USA. At only 26 years old, he has appeared on Fox News, CNBC, and Fox Business News over 500 times. He is also a best-selling author and a podcast host. He was the youngest speaker of the 2016 Republican National Convention, and you probably saw him open this year for the 2020 RNC. He has never been to college, but he is a close friend and supporter of President Donald Trump. It's my honor and privilege to welcome the one and only Charlie Kirk. Charlie, do you mind if I start us off with prayer real quick? Oh, please do. It's great. Right, thank cool. you. Father, I just thank you so much for Charlie and for Erica. And just thank you for yes. the, just, I feel like I know him, even though he has no idea who I am. But Lord, <laughs> I just pray that you'll bless him, Lord. I thank you for the favor you've given him as a young man. I pray even for a greater anointing and favor. I thank you, Lord, that his favor comes from you and not from compromise. I ask that you would just use him mightily. I pray that he would just be a mighty man of God, filled with your Holy Spirit, and he would speak the truth in love. And I just ask, we just ask that you bless this podcast and it would, you would use it to further your will in America and the world. And we just pray for that you would guide our tongues, that uh, you say you control the king's heart like a water course. I pray that you would direct our speech, direct what we, we say, and may it really change the hearts and minds of people. You said the truth will set us free. I love what Charlie said before. The liberals have almost everything, but they don't have truth. Amen. And thank you, Jesus, that you are the way the truth, and the life. And I pray, I thank you for young men like Charlie who are speaking to secular people, to speak on campuses. I like what he says, I go there so you don't have to. Lord, anoint him. May his ministry be even greater this year than it's ever been. In Jesus' mighty name, we commit this podcast to you. As your word says, whatever you commit to the Lord, it shall be established. Your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I look forward to, to coming and speaking there hopefully soon. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. You're a little busy, aren't you? <laughs> Just, <laughs> Just a, a little, little bit. bit. Yeah, but we're gonna we're working with Erica on it and we'll get yeah. it done. So it'll be great. So now what do you so now you're you speak you this is the second time you spoke at the RNC, right? This is you did Yeah, it? the second time. Wow. Yeah. So uh, first time was back in two thousand sixteen and the first time I went to the RNC was in two thousand twelve when I had to almost uh kind of break myself into the convention. I had to sneak in. So <laughs> cool. I went from sneaking in in 2012 to opening the convention in 2020. That's, cool. that's awesome. You know, that's the, praise be to God. Only in America is a story like that. Amen. Amen. That's cool. And so, yeah, so that's cool yeah. that you did that. Um, are you, the other thing, uh, now are you helping, now Mariah said you're helping like President Trump with some debate prep or something like that? Is that? Um, well, more or less. I mean, I, I wouldn't say in an official capacity, but okay. I definitely speak to him more than most people. And I have a great relationship with him, and uh, I did a whole podcast on how I think he should handle certain questions that he might be asked. And I actually think that the winning, the winning thesis for him, the thing that resonates more than ever before is, Joe, I'm cleaning up your mess that you made 40 years in Washington. Mm -hmm. Why would we put you back? That's the framing, that I'm cleaning up your mess exactly. type thing. Is, is yeah. that, that's a very, very effective argument for him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. And then just the, I mean, I don't know if you want to get into this, but just the antichrist spirit, because if you notice some of the Trump commercials, they show him holding up the Bible as if that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that crazy? That'd yeah. be an honorable. And most, most presidents want to be known as I, I'm pro, I'm a Christian, you know, man, I believe in God, but they're showing that as like, that's a negative thing. Like he's Hitler, kind of like he's doing the Hitler stuff. I mean, it's like, how yeah. can holding up the Bible be a bad thing? Yeah. But, well, I've seen that ad more than any other. It seems that they're trying to mock him that he decided to hold up the Bible in yeah. that uh, in that square. So, I mean, look, you, in a lot of different ways, you're seeing someone who's actually defended uh, religious liberty, defended the unborn, defended free speech, defended religious assembly, and the other side has gone out of their way to to try and criminalize those activities. Yeah. They're going out of their way to pander to very, very dangerous voices in our country. And you even saw this. Uh, in the Democrat convention where they took out of the words under God yeah. in their uh, in their uh, their reciting of the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah. And so this mm -hmm. is not just um, this is not something to be ignored. It's amazing how I don't know if you agree with it, but I really think the root of all this is someone was saying I heard a pastor that it's getting away from God. That's why it's like the divided states, Amen. because you basically have people that realize we need to return back to God. And you got people that saying God is what's messed up our country. No, I mean, but look, we also have to be honest that the Bible built the soul of Western civilization. So every 
Country and Civilization Has a Soul, Whether We Like It or Not. It's a phenomenal book that I'm reading by a man named Vishal Mang Dawali. I always mispronounce his last name, called The Book That Built Your World. And he articulates everything that I've been talking and you've been talking about for years, which is if you go around the world, there are certain things that we take for granted as common sense in the West that is not common sense the rest of the world. And not the least of which is the view of the individual. And this is a very important thing because um, if you believe in God and you believe in Jesus Christ, you believe that every individual has to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And that idea of personal relationship, it's not communal relationship, it's not family relationship, all those things are very important. But if you do not have a personal relationship, your mom can't save you for you, your cousin can't save you Mm -hmm. for you, you can't save it for you, it has to be personal. And so therefore, the entire West was built on this idea of every individual made in the image of God. That's where we get this idea of individual rights. And Mm. it's so often people say, that's just common sense. Well, it's just not. It's actually Western sense. Mm. Most of the world doesn't respect those sorts of teachings or it doesn't have that in their law or their judicial system. And so what's really happening right now, and I I agree, it's people that want to grow closer to God and be able to continue to assemble um, religiously and peacefully. And then those people that quite honestly want to think, see the church and see religion have a far um, lower standing in American society, if not yeah. altogether. Yeah. Abolished. And I mean, you said it with your pastor, Rob McCoy, is that it's really, this has happened on the church's watch. I mean, we've sort of been silent, you know, like he was saying how Calvary was a bunch of hippies. I used to be a hippie that you just kind of thought, Hey man, just, you know, just give us, you know, Jesus, no really, no uh, politics. That's like bad. But we see that we really, the church is supposed to, it wasn't supposed to be the state influences the church so much, but the, the church influences the state, right? The Danbury Baptist, you know, it's that we were supposed to have effect. And if you, you've been to Washington more than me, but you see all the Christian things, you know, like Pocahontas being baptized in the Capitol. So to say we're not a Christian nation or founded on the principle of Christianity is simply a lie. Yeah, but. yeah it's not true at all. And just to kind of reinforce the part about um, the kind of the Calvary chapels, uh, Rob McCoy is my pastor, and he mentions that Calvary Chapel has had astronomical growth. And look at the culture around it. I mean, what if Calvary Chapel was involved in school board races and political fights? Yeah. And I, I think that the church has completely failed on this issue of being involved in the political realm for a lot of different reasons. Part of it is just some eschatological reasons. Some churches would say that it's not worth it because the world's you know going to end soon. I think that's a, a poor excuse. Yeah. Other reasons are just that they say that, um, you know, Christians should not be involved in politics. I think that is theologically questionable. It says very clearly in Proverbs to stand up for the innocent yeah. and those people that cannot protect themselves. And that's through, that's what laws are yeah. supposed to do. And how do you make laws? It's through politics and through yeah. civil government. But the final thing I'll say is this, which is really interesting, is that you look at the formation of our country, uh, and especially if you kind of look at where the founding fathers were contemplating what kind of country we wanted, um, there was this lie that all the founding fathers were deists. Now, while there were some founding fathers that were deists, even Benjamin Franklin himself was a child of the First Great Awakening. Yeah. He found his inspiration and first principles and liberty from activist pastors, from the Black Robe Regiment. Yeah. Hmm. And so this is, it's, a mis- yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a misapplication of history and I think a misreading of history to say that our country is anything less then founded from the Judeo-Christian ethic, which is that kind of combination of reason and revelation, which is found in the Bible. Um, unlike some Eastern religions, and this is a really important part, really important thing that Christianity never dived into Gnosticism. It's a really important victory that, that Christianity is about more speech, the better, the more ideas colliding. Um, actually, Christians more so than any other faith will actually seek out opposing conversations, will want to actually have their views challenged. We take this for granted, but then we built a whole society mm-hmm. around it, very pluralistic. Yeah. And so, again, you go to the rest of the world. This is not built into their ethos. This idea that ultimate truth will prevail and there's such a thing as ultimate truth is without a doubt derived from the Bible. Well, we actually had your girlfriend Erica on a couple of weeks ago, and she is super kind and yeah. wise. And to me, one of the hardest workers that I've seen and definitely a Proverbs 31 woman. She inspires me, but also you, even though you're not a Proverbs 31 woman, you're still <laughs> very hardworking. You're um, releasing two podcasts a day. So we encourage everyone to go to the Charlie Kirk show subscribe. to Apple podcasts to subscribe, give them a five star review. And we also know that you are traveling a ton that you spoke. Well, in 2016 at the RNC and this year you opened the RNC. So you are, you know, at the White House lot with President Trump. 
supporting and campaigning. So we're super thankful for that. And you're the president and founder of Turning Point USA, which again, we are so blessed with that. But anyway, getting to the question, um, we know that there, that you've been traveling, you've seen all these churches, you've seen just what's been going on. We know like two months ago or so, there was like the big black square thing with BLM Incorporated and churches, a lot of them supporting that. And we know that really it's compromise and it's fearing man instead of fearing God, because I love how you've said it before. It's that obviously we don't want to stand before God and knowing that we didn't defend the lives of these unborn children. And really a lot of it is these black babies too, that they're saying, oh, mm-hmm. BLM, but they don't stand up against abortion, which mm. is ridiculous. But anyway, so we want to talk about um, and be able, to, we are allowed to judge, like just saying it to the people listening in First Corinthians 5, 9 through 13. It isn't our responsibility to ju- judge outsiders. So with Turning Point USA, a lot of people put you down for this, but you accept a lot of people, right, in different areas. But if they're not calling themselves Christians, you really can't judge them. But the churches and the pastors that are calling themselves Christians and then, you know, willfully supporting these whatever movements or things that are not of God, it's really just fearing man. And so we can judge them. So our question to you, I know it took a long way to say it, but um, what do you think of those woke Christians or really I think they're liberal and they call themselves Christians. Um, Do you think that they're the ones destroying this country? Well, first of all, I agree. Erica is amazing. And she truly is <laughs> a Proverbs 31 woman. So I have to make sure that I reinforce that. Yes. And I'm so I'm so glad she introduced me to you guys. So uh, she's a blessing to so many people, including myself. Yes. So look, the, uh, the BLM Incorporated thing is very dangerous. And God bless you guys for speaking out against mm-hmm. it. This is one of the greatest threats to Christianity yeah. that we have seen probably in the history of our country. And I don't say that lightly. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying in the history of Christianity I and mean, the Christianity survived massive Roman persecution and other very difficult, um, let's just say struggles with Islamic uh, conquering throughout, you know, throughout the middle ages. But this is probably one of the greatest threats to Christianity in the modern era mm-hmm. because it disguised itself so differently. And it, and it really is camouflaged within nice sounding sound bites that really misinterpret theology and you're seeing the Southern Baptist Convention start to endorse BLM Incorporated yeah. in critical race theory. And so that's what this really is. And so for anyone watching this, they might say, well, Charlie, how could you possibly disagree with the phrase Black Lives Matter? Well, if you listen to my podcast, I go out of my way yes. to make sure I say the phrase is, of course, true. Instead, I put all my criticism on something different called BLM Incorporated. Amen. I yeah. came up with it. It has now been popularized. I encourage everyone to say that. Therefore, there's no confusion from the outside world as to what we're saying and how we're saying it. And and I never said that what we're criticizing is the true phrase. However, I will not, I will, I will have, I will pull no punches when it comes to the criticism of the organization. The organization is a Marxist insurgent organization on their website. They say they want to destroy the Western prescribed nuclear family, abolish prisons, abolish police. Their leaders engage in open witchcraft on the streets of Los Angeles. They want more abortions in our country. They want to legalize sex work. And that's just their starting point. Yeah. That's what they tell right. us they believe. Not, I mean, not even some of their more deeply held yeah. resentments that somehow pour out, such as we hate all white people and that they believe that looting and terrorism is a form of reparations, which certain BLM leaders have yeah. articulated. Yeah. But I'm just going to go by their website. Like, yeah. Let's not try to do any, let's just go straight to their website. So this is rooted in this idea of critical race theory, which really comes back from the Frankfurt School. It seeps into every single university and college across our country and high school uh, from this guy named Herbert Marcuse, who, again, I don't want to get too philosophical or too heady, but the problem is that this this went into all the secular schools, and now recently it's gone into all the theological schools. Mm. And so you cannot go to most theological seminaries. There's still some great ones out there, especially, um, I I mean, Liberty University has a great uh, divinity school that completely rejects critical race theory, but almost every major theological seminary in the country is teaching critical race theory. So here's there's seven attributes of critical race theory. I just did a whole podcast on it and a social media post on it, and it, it's straight from left-wing liberal atheistic academics who have been writing this who say this is wrong. I just had two of them on my podcast really fair-minded people who are atheist liberals who said, you guys don't understand how dangerous this is. We are atheist liberals, and we're speaking out against this. And really nice people, uh, James Lindsay and Peter Bogosian. In fact, I have more respect for these atheist yeah. liberals and some of these pastors yep. that pander to critical race theory. 
that takes a lot for me to say that. <laughs> but so anyway, here's what critical race theory is. Number one, they believe that melanin is the master of all, that the color of your skin should dictate everything, oh. <laughs> that it does not matter who you are, your values, your worldview, your salvation, your spirituality, all that stuff is irrelevant. Instead, we're going to judge people on tribal groups. Understand Jesus Christ put human co- human beings and our entire humanity thousands of years forward where he challenged this idea of tribal identity. And you kind of saw this in the idea of the good Samaritan, right, where someone wouldn't help someone on the side of their street because they were from a different geographic mm-hmm. location. For us in the West, we, just, that's, that, we don't understand that concept, right? If decent, reasonable Americans are walking down their own home, their street, the neighborhood, and they see someone on the side of their street, we have an impulse to try to help that person. I'm not saying every person would. There's obviously bad people. But generally, our society has been built on this ethic, the Christian ethic. You see someone suffering, let's do something about it. But in, in Christ's time, that wasn't built into humanity. It was very much tribal. Yeah. It's like, you don't look like me. You're from a different area. And Christ completely blew up that whole paradigm. Yeah. It took hundreds of years for that teaching to be articulated a, a, correctly by Augustine and by the early church. But eventually, we built a whole society around it called the West. They want us to they want to go back before Christ is what this is. They want to go back to tribal identity. And this is in itself one of the most dangerous movements you could possibly believe, because if all of a sudden your your values don't matter, your worldview doesn't matter, only your skin color matters. Well, then that's the death of science, reason, mathematics. And so there's seven attributes of critical race theory. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I'll go through it really quick. They do not believe in individuals. They Mm. favor Marxism. They think that science, math, and evidence and reason are all attributes of whiteness. You saw the Smithsonian Museum come out with that recently. Again, they believe melanin is their master. They believe speech and us actually discussing different ideas is an instrument of white supremacy. Um, And so, again, I could go through all of it, but this is what BLM Incorporated is rooted in, right? And so here's the problem is that because of the Christian ethic, here's actually where Christianity has been so successful in America without ever realizing it, and they're using it against us. So the Christian ethic taught that racism is a sin. That's how we abolished slavery, had the Civil Rights Act, and actually became the most, the least racist country in the history of the world. Amen. So we build the least racist country in the history of the world. And then the question is, what if you actually go so far that your country hates racism so much, you hate being called a racist, that it becomes almost a tool of paralytic. It almost paralyzes yeah. you, where if you get called that, you're unable to have a conversation. And this is the evil of the left. They use that against us, yeah. right? So if you dare criticize critical race theory or BLM Incorporated, they say the one thing, you are a racist. You're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to call that because we've been taught correctly that's an evil thing. Yeah. Where did that come from? From Christianity. It's destroyed all discussion. And so now people are trying to seek out favor and win approval by BLM Incorporated by saying, I don't want to be called that horrible thing. Therefore, what do I have to do? Do I have to post that black square? Do I got to take it? Whatever it takes, I don't want to be called that thing. This is seeking approval from man, not from God. And and unfortunately, it's actually, this is the awful irony, it's built as a byproduct of the Christian system we live in, right? So Christianity taught us racism is a sin that then goes all throughout society. Everyone basically agrees to that, right? You have to go out of your way to find a racist in American society. You just do. It's actually really hard. We're so unbelievably unracist, considering how many languages and cultures and nationalities represented. It's actually pretty incredible. And so then... People then go seek they, – they, then they have these mobs that go around and say, you are this awful thing because you don't subscribe to it. Incredibly totalitarian. They say white silence is violence. I mean they would have made wonderful Soviets. Like if you do not agree <laughs> with everything that I say, yeah. then somehow you're evil. That is a totalitarian mindset. Man. Again, that's not Christian either. Man. We never, ever have done that in the West. We've never said if you do not accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, we are going to come hunt you down. <laughs> We're like, I hope that God calls you, mm. right? Again, so you can kind of see how this whole system of the West, the Christian West, is now being disintegrated in front of our eyes mm-hmm. by these people. And so I'm happy to go further, but they, any no. pastor that panders to critical race theory or BLM Incorporated should resign. They're, they're doing yeah. uh, very insidious things. Amen. So they're try, They're sort of then, like you said, try, they're sort of shredding Martin Luther King, who said, I long for the Jr. day, Martin Luther King Jr., that said, I long for the day when my child will be judged by his character and not by his skin color. So they're sort of wiping all oh, that yeah. away, right? I mean, so... Yet they would say they, oh, that's they love exactly him. exactly right. I mean, so we built a whole society around that. In fact, so look, I was in high school eight years ago. Eight years, actually, it's nine years ago. Not eight years ago, I would have graduated this last June. And I told you this for a reason. I went to a high school in the, pub, in the suburbs of Chicago, 53% Hispanic, right? So I was a minority as a white person in my school. And so demographically, you know, being in Tucson or Phoenix, you guys can understand um, there's, you know, kind of a similar cultural landscape. However, it's a real, it was a really weird thing because I, I think I'm perfectly positioned to take a really aggressive stance on this, which is why I have. 
because I grew up in the last part of colorblind America mm. where my parents said, you go make friends with people no matter their Amen. skin color, no matter their culture, their race or their background. And so this whole like new post-racial world that I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, pre-racial like world, I don't know the right term for it actually, is where it's unbelievably racist where they, oh, you white, you, you have to atone for something because the color of their skin. I'm like eight years ago, I, my best friends were Hispanic, yeah. black, Lithuanian, South African, Nicaraguan. And it was a really weird thing. While of course there was plenty of juvenile joking that went around, we actually just looked at each other as human beings. Yeah. We literally didn't care about our colors, our differences, a melanin. You just kind of talk about values. And Amen. You actually judge people as being that person. I don't like that person because of what they did, not because of how they look. Yeah. And so now I have to be convinced that somehow we should deteriorate that. And the weird thing is it actually worked really well. Yeah. The high school that I went in had 100 different countries and cultures represented. As Wheeling High School It's described as one of the most diverse high schools in all the state of Illinois and in our country. And so I can speak from personal experience. I didn't go to the typical Lily White type high school in the north suburbs of Chicago. But now I see that very high school I went to embrace BLM and they have more racial problems than they've ever had. Mm, and I, I can tell you, they created this. Yeah. Yes. Like they went out of yeah. their way to go create and almost inculcate sin where, quite honestly, it was almost completely eradicated. Yeah. And so I, I can I can tell you that this is a very this is a this is a very troubling trend. And the other thing I'll say about this is the church has always been on the right side of racial issues in our country. And this is one of the mega pastors from New York. I'm not going to say his name. He said, oh, the church has been the biggest arbiter of white supremacy. Well, first <laughs> well, of all, I, I, I challenge him on this. And he says, I don't understand how anyone could possibly find this to be controversial. And maybe there were a couple churches in the South. And I've talked, I, again, I grew up in the North where the church actually started the Republican Party in Ripon, Wisconsin, right? We are the anti-slavery Amen. movement. The church has always been on the right side of these issues, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, women's suffrage. And so while there might have been some churches misapplying theology throughout the American South, it was the church that was always the drumbeat of organizing, of abolition of slavery and getting rid of the ills and the sins in America. And so I take great exception with churches that are now all of a sudden doing the opposite, yeah. where the church built this country and actually achieved racial progress when it was necessary. Of course it was. Now the church is doing the opposite. Now the church is a regressive force in our country. Amen. Think about how it's terrible. Well, the scary yeah, well, thing is them having to stand before God, because obviously it's in the Bible, like the verse first Samuel 16, seven, um, the Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And honestly, if people just read their Bibles and it comes down to like, I think Ali Sucky, she has in her podcast room, but Ronald Reagan says most of the problems men face are on the covers of the Bible. Like it's in the Bible. But the sad thing is, is the pastors, they're like Samuel. I mean, they're like Saul, sorry. They fear the people, but like King David, Feared he God. feared God. Like he didn't care what people thought. And that's what we need to get back to. And then um, that's why we're so thankful for you encouraging the pastors to stand up because you're allowed to, like you're yeah. allowed to spur the pastors yeah. because they are Christ followers yeah. and we can judge them. And what we want to get back to is like, Can you've someone? mentioned it. You want to talk about the black robe? Yeah. I want to talk about yeah. Charlie. I love I the, the, the black robe regiment. You yes. know, they were the ones who inspired the breakaway. They were the ones that they said, we're going to kill you because you're speaking out. And I love what one Peter pastor Muhlenberg. said, the problem, you know, Peter Muhlenberg, you remember yeah. him where he pulled out the sword and had his mm -hmm. continental, uh, uh, uniform underneath his robe but it's like i heard someone say that pastors today are evangelifish <laughs> you know because they're so afraid of just pleasing people but we know we stand on proverbs twenty nine twenty five that says the fear of man will prove to be a snare but he who trusts in the lord is kept safe Amen. so we need to fear god right because even if man doesn't like us at the end of the day we're going to be happy that we feared god rather than man because we want to be on the right side of god not not a Amen. blm but uh yeah what can you speak to that i mean the saying pastors. about pastors standing up because that's the thing i see is at least the pastors around tucson a lot of them will say, don't speak on politics. Don't, don't talk but about yet, President Trump. We yeah. see people, the old men of God, they spoke. I mean, Muhlenberg, as I said, pulled out that sword and said, hey, you got to fight for your rights. And remember, I don't know if you know the story, but his brother, I can't remember his name, but he said, don't talk about politics. You got to get out of this. You just speak about Christ. Then his church was burned down in New York. Mm -hmm. Then he said, okay. And I think they both became like colonels really yeah. high up in the army to fight because they realized you can't have freedom without speaking the truth and without fighting. Well, and so yeah, this is where I know. And so it's kind of funny because I come at it from a political perspective as a Christian. So I'm, I'm actually able, it's, 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 I'm a different opinion. I say, how could you not get involved in politics? Amen. This is my day-to-day -day job, right? So I, I, my grading curve is a little bit different, right? <laughs> where I come from the political world 
and I look at the Christian world, I say, you don't understand what's happening in this political world is impacting you, impacting the country. And so that's where I think I'm in a unique position because I don't necessarily come from the Christian world into the political world. I think it's the opposite, if you know what I mean, kind of in my day-to-day work. And so the first thing is this. Number one, most of the secular world has lost complete trust in Christianity yeah. in America because of our lack of standing on these issues. Amen. I know so many people that listen to our my podcast and listen to our show that are secular. They're searching. They say, Charlie, why am I fighting harder for the life of the innocent than most of the church? Do they even believe what they say? And I don't have a good answer Amen. for that. So all of a sudden, most of the secular world is less likely to commit their life to Jesus Christ, that they yeah. do not see the church acting boldly and with courage. That's that's completely discounted. And the second thing, I just ask any pastor out there, and anyone watching this needs to go to their pastor very clearly and say, okay, you don't believe we should get in politics. They say yes. Then what is your line? Like, yeah. when, when? And they say never. I'll say, okay, so never is your answer. So when the rail cars come to take people away, you still wouldn't speak out. Mm. And people will say, well, that's not realistic. I'll say, have you not read the 20th yeah, exactly. century history? Seven years ago. 130 million people killed intentionally because churches did nothing or they were silenced and they were killed. So if the answer is never, then just say, and they say, well, it's not worth it now. I say a million babies every single year are terminated in the womb. Yep. Is that okay with you? And they'll say, oh, I, I do Sanctity Life Sunday. It's like, really? Are you doing all you possibly can? Mm. And the answer is, of course not. The church is is weak Oh, the church is incredibly weak on abortion, Amen. and and it's because they're trying to win approval from secular culture. There's no other reason for it at all whatsoever. Yeah. And it's not just about it's not just about abortion, about freedom of speech. It's about free enterprise, private property rights. All those things matter, but the life issue is such a cut and dry Amen. issue that I just can't. so what so what you're saying, Charlie, is not silence is violence. You're saying silence is compliance. Right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, especially the, the church is held to a different standard, though. I, I, I hold Christians in the church to a completely Amen. different standard than just a, just a normal person. I hate to use normal, but just a non-Christian on the side of the street who's still searching for truth. Yep. If you have truth, if you believe it, you read your Bible, you're convicted enough to teach the correct eschatology of the end of the world, yet you're not convicted enough to tell the evils of socialism, Marxism, secularism, or abortion— then I, I, I am not going to be light in my criticism of you. And I've received plenty of backlash from pastors who think I'm being too aggressive, and that's fine. I, I mean, that, that means I'm doing my job. Yeah. That means my message is being heard by them. Amen. Yeah, like Jesus said, woe to you when all men speak well of you like they did the false prophets. So Amen. you're doing something right. Amen. And then also we want to talk about the importance, right, of the church standing up, but also meeting together because we've compromised. We've just been like, oh, you don't want us to meet? Okay, we won't meet. And it literally says in Hebrews, I think, 10, yeah, 1025, to not forsake the fellowship of believers, as some are in the habit of doing, especially as the day of the Lord approaches. For us with eschatology, we believe that, you know, the God's, God's going to come back for us. He's going to come back for his bride. But we also believe that we're not going to stop fighting. We're not like, oh, he's coming back. So the world's going to have to get bad. So we're just going to give up. No, we need to fight harder because we don't want to hear, think in Matthew 25, it says, you wicked, lazy servant, depart from me. Like, we don't want to hear that. We want to hear well done. So we know that ecclesia means called out from the home to come to the home. And we don't need when they come to church, a pep rally or motivational speech. That's what most churches do. We need to be able to say the hard things. So I believe that that's what awakening is. We've seen the great awakenings with Whitfield and all that. But the thing is, is that we don't need another exciting message or a like charismatic, like, woo woo. Like we don't need a little excitement, but we need to be awakened to our sin, to awaken to our carnality and how fleshly we are. So what would... And I got to say this, and what's wild to me, Charlie, here you are being used by God to kind of spur Amen. on the church. Yes. But as you know, Whitfield inspired um, uh, Benjamin Franklin, mm-hmm. even though he was That's sort right. of a deist. Yep. But isn't it amazing how you're, and I'm, I'm not dogging, I hope it is, but you're inspiring the church to stand up when it should be me well, inspiring you to yeah. stand up. You know what I mean? No, it used to be the But I've been way. inspired by others too. It's, it's, it's a harmony. It's a yeah. harmony, right? So it's not like I'm ex nihilo and I came out of nothing, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. It's but you know what I'm Boy, saying though? Yeah, I'm yeah. saying is no, I there's not that, that many also, pastors that I would say do you, that are really, I mean, your yeah, pastor, yeah, pastor, Jack Hibbs. Hibbs, but not a lot. I'd say probably, I don't know what percentage, but I'm saying in the old days, especially the beginning of this country, it was the pastors Amen. that really influenced the leaders, not the leaders influencing the pastors. And, and now Amen. I'm seeing Amen. you inspire a lot of pastors. You've inspired me. And I say that, I, I'll, I'll say it for me, you put me to shame and I'm considered a bold pastor, mm-hmm. but I'm going, I 
wish that I inspired you more. And I'm saying that's an indictment to me because if I'm oh really speaking the truth in love with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I mean, really yeah. not being, ooh, but you know what I mean? True power Amen. and authority where people like, you know, I think, I don't know if it was you, somebody was saying how the, he was speaking on Harvard Whitfield and and uh, Benjamin Franklin mocked it out and said, you're speaking to 30,000 people. This is amazing. I mean, how many pastors woo a deist or someone who's in government, they go, this guy is amazing. I, I see power here that I don't even see in the, in, in the Congress or the White House. And that's the way I really think, and especially the last days, us pastors need to really step up Amen. and say, God, here I am, send me, kind of like Isaiah, use me to not just encourage my little flock, but to be inspirational to great leaders, you know. So. Amen. Well, thank you. There's a couple thoughts on it. I really appreciate that. And I think that part of it is that certain pastors – some of them have been taught so poorly in theological seminary. They, they, if, I, if people say, Charlie, what's the, two, what's the one or two things you wish pastors would learn? And it, my answer is always really different than you would anticipate. I wish most pastors took an economics course. Mm. I, actually, it's a really important thing. And, and, and I have a contrarian view on this. We have the laws of nature and nature is God. We have the laws of uh, physics. We all accept these things. There's also laws of economics. It's actually a really interesting thing. And I, I don't think we should just turn our back on them because e if you do not have any sort of understanding of economics where when you start to believe in critical race theory or Marxism, your entire society is going to fall apart. And so I think a lot of pastors actually don't have the literacy in this space. And I want to give them a, just a, a little period of grace. Like if that's you, that's fine. Use me as cover fire, right? Reach out to me. Listen to my podcast. I'm doing two a day. I, t I touch every topic under the sun, right? And there's great resources out there. Rob McCoy, Jack Hibbs, Pastor Dave, uh, James Cadiz, uh, Pastor Cody, Ken Graves. I've spoken to all these guys' churches. They're amazing. And so that's the first thing. And the second thing is this, and I, I, I know you guys want to talk about the next great awakening. I have a completely different, I have, an, I have a contrarian opinion of where the next great awakening in our country is actually going to come from. And it's, I, I think there's a reason for it. And so I think the next great awakening is actually going to be a Galatians 3 awakening, mm. different than the first four where it's going to be the law being a school teacher to Christ. Mm -hmm. So since people are in such a state of chaos, similar to the the, 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 the nation of Israel and when they were in the wilderness, I think you have to get people very basically organized before you can even talk to them about Christ. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? And Jordan Peterson demonstrated this, and Jem Jordan Peterson can be the beginning of it, where 12 biblical principles, he said it's 12 rules for life, but young people in particular, they're looking for truth. But before you can even get talk to them, I think about really dedicating their life to Jesus, you have to also just teach them the roots of the law. Like here Amen. are 15 things you should do. And Amen. then all of a sudden that will point them to Christ. I'm seeing it happen all the time, all the time. And the church generally, the kind of Christian ink or whatever, they completely reject this Amen. nationally. They think it should be only about, and they say, only teach the gospel. Charlie, you don't talk about the gospel. Like, okay, I do, first of all. Mm. But I, I also think that if you're going to read the gospel, Jesus made plenty of allusions back to Old Testament scripture. If you're really going to understand it, you have to understand Deuteronomy. Yeah. You have to understand Leviticus. Yeah. You have to understand First and Second Samuel. You have to understand Isaiah. Yep. You have to, if you really want to understand John 1 and all that. And so I think that's where the next, oh, I, I mean, I could be wrong, of yeah. course, but from my personal experience, I think young people in particular, when I talk to them very bluntly and I say, get your life together, aim at something meaningful, yeah. stop doing things that are harmful, follow the Ten Commandments. They do those things. They say, well, Charlie, I'm doing those things, and now I'm realizing my life is getting better, but I'm still not enough. Mm. Good answer. Amen. There's actually something beyond this, Amen. and that's actually where I think we can find the next great awakening. In our and Charlie, country. that it's so great you say that yeah. because I was raised kind of as a hippie by two liberal professors, <laughs> oh, yeah. and so I had no rule. I could sleep with my girlfriends. I could do. I could stay out all night. I could do drugs with my. I could do anything, and I was the cool kid, believe it or not, to my secular friends. You know, I wasn't a Christian, of course, and uh, so when I got saved, I didn't see the law as oh bummer. Mm -mm. I saw it as like a guardrail. Amen. Like I, my life was That's out of right. control, and I was so there, thankful. Great, so as we yeah. go away from the law, right? You know, because we need. You know, isn't it funny how they say the liberals say we don't need guns because Charlie, we have the police. But wait, we don't have the police now, so do we get to keep our guns? You know, and only the only people will come with guns, I think, as you said, to take our guns, but it's just so ironical. But I was saying I'm a product of when I saw the, when I heard the and law, then, I loved it. Yes. I loved the law. You know what I mean? I love the absolute truth because and, and, it freed and, and me. And so, and not two, or two, two thoughts on that really quick. First of all, there's a great quote at Harvard, at Harvard Law, they're going to take this down, where it says, the law is the wise restraints that keep men free. I mean, that is one of the most paradoxically complex yeah. statements ever. I mean, that the law guardian actually keeps you free. It's incredible. And it's 
It's true. The second thing is that not dissimilar than the state of hippiness that you were once in is where a lot of young people are living, but they're actually in a lot more moral chaos than even the hippies were in the 60s Mm -hmm. or 70s today. And it's actually that sort of law-based teaching pointing to Christ. And we don't, and people say, well, Charlie, you're going to be too legalistic. I've never said that. Okay. And I don't believe that. I, I think that if you have very basic applicable laws for living and for living a good life and improved life, that will point people to Christ. It will. I've Amen. seen it happen. Amen. But just but just focusing, just if your whole teaching is just on just on grace, and I'm not saying that's not important, then I think it's actually missing out. And I also think at times some very weak theology in Christianity Amen. can almost paint it as a hippie doctrine, yeah. believe it or not. Yeah, yeah I see a you're, lot of like, Christian you're hippies today. You're in the today. fields, you're in the flowers, you know, yeah. you're like, okay, great. That's not how you read Matthew 5. Yeah. So. Exactly. We have that with my own, I have my own sons kind of going through that. And it's like one of my sons. And so you see how, you know, Jesus said what in John 14? If you love me, you, you obey, obey my commands. We don't obey to be saved. We obey because we are mm-hmm. saved, because we're so appreciative of the grace and mercy of God. Amen. But we sort of lost that like, oh, I'm, I'm you know, and I think it's so funny. I saw you what's talking with your pastor about calvinism but we have why i kind of fight calvinism Amen. is because we have a lot of people at least in our area here in tucson that say oh i have my chosen card so i can live however i want mm-hmm. i can be the frozen chosen yeah, where well, calvin very, said you're chosen to be holy Amen. so really if you're chosen if you're if you're really chosen you should show up by your, your your life that obeys the law of god out of love not out of i want to legalism like because legalism yeah. right? i do this 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 so i'm saved no we say you obey out of that. love, you know? Yeah, and look, I, I, I was raised in a Presbyterian church, and the answer with the Calvinist thing is I, I, I don't know is my answer, and I think that's an okay position right. for Christians. Is maybe we do have agency, maybe we don't, maybe it's just an aberration. I think it's kind of a fun coffee shop conversation between yeah. Christians. I actually think it's far too dominant of Christian conversation, to be honest. Yeah. Um, where and, and maybe again, I don't know where I land on. I don't know what the, I don't know where it is. I I know people I really respect that are five point Calvinists and people that are not, and I think they both are really smart people. And so, but I think what you touch on is very important. Is that sometimes Calvinist Calvinism ends up in two things that are very dangerous. And it's by the way, every little blend of Protestantism or Catholicism, whatever can have its own issues. Yeah. Here are the two issues I find with people that first identify as a Calvinist Christian, and I think that's a problem. So number one, there's a cockiness that sometimes yes. just yeah. emanates, where it's like, I am the save, do you want my, you know, I have the past <laughs> of the country club and you don't. I grew up around some of these Christians and I never liked that, yeah. okay? I thought that was really awful. That's number one. Number two is what you say is like, oh, God will forgive me because mm. I'm one of the elect. Like, I kind of, I can cut the corners here, I can do that. And I've never liked that. Um, and I've seen people actually rationalize very bad decisions Amen. by doing that. Amen. And John and John Calvin said, "You're chosen to be holy." Amen. So really, they're going beyond John because they're not. It's never should be one of the pastors here. It was hardcore Calvinist said, you're, "We're the chosen, frozen, frozen, chosen." That's an oxymoron mm-hmm. because Jesus said, "I wish you were hot or cold," but since you're lukewarm, right? I mean, I guess cold, right? Because <laughs> the hope is you'll come to God. Amen. But no way can you be in God's will and be cold. You know what I mean? That's not God's will for a Christian. No, amen. That's right. Amen. And then we also love the quote um, John Adams said, our constitution was made only for a moral religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And for us, like we see that it's like, it's not going to work just for those who are just, I'm just going to do whatever and trust. Like we need, you know, the Bible, we need to be able to be reading our Bibles. And we're wondering why all these problems are happening. And we're like, first of all, we took God out of the schools. We took the Bible and all of that. And so we're wondering why all this craziness and it happened on, I mean, I can say I work at the church and my dad's a pastor, but it's like, it happened under our watch. Like we didn't stand up and fight when this was happening. And it's like, why does it like for us too, it's like Matthew 16, 26, it says, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and lose your soul? Like, why does it matter even, it sounds bad, but who cares even if you're a Republican and you don't end up, like you said, Galatians 3, I think it's verses 23 and 24, that law brings you to faith. If you don't end up coming to faith, it's all meaningless, truly, like it says in Ecclesiastes. If you don't fear God and obey his commandments and you just live a comfortable life, like, oh, I just want... America to be America to be comfortable. No, if we don't understand the importance of what well, you talk about this, how salvation is essential, then it really doesn't matter. So what would you say on that? 
Yeah, and, and so a couple things. I mean, the first of which is that Christians built this country, and now Christians and its lack of involvement, and now its actually activistic involvement in the destruction of it, are trying to actually tear apart this beautiful gift that was mm. prayed over, that was sacrificed for, and that it just wasn't a mistake. And this is what's so interesting about our country's history, and I wish our kids were taught this correctly, is that most countries come as kind of backing into it, right? So it's like one country or one civilization controls this piece of land. And for a great example of this is, you know, what is now known as Istanbul or Constantinople, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the, 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 the Muslims did not build Istanbul. They conquered it from the Eastern Roman Empire, King Constantine. They eventually won a long siege, right? And But, but they, they then put in their customs and their ideas and they just continue them on, right? The American founding was something totally different. There was a rebellion because they believe that why is King George have all this power? Because we don't believe he's the sovereign. We believe that the people are the sovereign mm -hmm. made in the image of God, that our natural rights are being offended and being violated. But then they took pause. And this is the really interesting thing. They planned something completely new. It is as close to that, as I said earlier, ex nihilo, out of nothing. It's like they mm -hmm. breathed a new country into existence, mm -hmm. but it was inspired by the Great Awakening. It was, but they had an opportunity. They could have created a theocracy that was tried in Italy and like mm -hmm. basically through um, the Catholic Roman Vatican kind of empire throughout Europe. So that's not a really good idea because what about all these different blends and sects of Christianity? They're just going to all fight each other. Amen. Let's try something where you just respect their freedom. And actually Christians are going to have to contest for conversions. They're going to have to be active. There was actually this idea, and it's actually really true, that when there isn't a state-run religion, Christianity does better. It's a really interesting. It's, it's completely paradoxical. Yeah. And I agree with it, that yeah. if you don't have the church within the state national religion, the church actually thrives more. Yeah. I completely agree. Because you can't and legislate morality. Mm. Yeah, it's also just because people are naturally going to rebel against the force. thing that you force yeah. upon them, mm -hmm. right? That's not, you have to, you actually love takes love and commitment to Christ. It actually takes persuasion, commitment, sacrifice, and a road to salvation. And so anyway, um, what's been really interesting, I think that Christians have to make a decision now is whether or not we actually like this country. Yeah. And, and if the answer is you're indifferent, then I'm telling you right now, I deal with these people when I mean these people, I mean the activists, leftists, the critical race theorists, and BLM Incorporated. It's not going to end well. And I'm not trying to be alarmist. I'm not trying to be dystopian. I'm not. I just, I, I know what drives these people. And the, the destruction you're seeing around us right now is just the very beginning. Amen. These people are not creators. They don't build. Yeah. They destroy. And do you agree, mm -hmm. Charlie? I, if you look at socialism or Marxism, first thing to go is the churches that speak oh, out yeah. against Always. it. So, I mean, we're going to, so we better speak out because we'll be like, you know, Peter Muhlenberg's brother, where all of a sudden the church is burnt to the ground and nobody's saying anything because we didn't speak the truth in love and kind of warn yeah, no, you're exactly we should right. be a voice. Amen. And that's why for us, we are so thankful for President Trump because he is the one who is giving the pastors and you, especially dad, the voice to be able to say this. And yeah. he, and what I, I love how your pastor, Pastor Rob McCoy said, it's like, he's like Samson. Like he truly, we need someone <laughs> to fight. And if you say, oh, he's terrible, whatever, I can't believe what he does. It's like, first of all, you're a hypocrite because yeah. think about what everyone else does. And if you yeah. really, if we really knew what other people did, but second of all, we need people to fight. We need people with a spine. We need people who are going to fight like Samson. And also Samson was in the hall of faith also. That's another yeah. thing. So <laughs> in Hebrews, yeah, yeah, in Hebrews 11. So it's like, we want to end with this question. We know you, we've been talking to you a lot, but we want to end with voting. Like how important that is like that. I love it. Um, I think, it, yeah, John Quincy Adams says, duty is ours, results are God's. So ultimately, that's our duty, like to vote. Like we need to vote and then yeah. we leave the or rest the to God. the Christian who says, oh, but, this is all rigged, so my vote doesn't count. I mean, how silly. Well, it's a very interesting yeah. thing. So I asked this question. Here's, here's kind of Aristotelian logic to use against a Christian. Does God care about what you do? Mm -hmm. The answer is, of course yeah. he does. The answer is, does God care about everything you do? Yes. Colossians 3, okay. 23. Then, yeah, exactly. Is voting doing something? Um, yes. yes. So then does God care about whether you vote or not? And your vote should be able to be defended and justified with your worldview. Yeah. It's not to make an excuse for every misstep that that person yeah. made. But if that person embraces a set of policies that has been the most pro-life president in American history, Amen. put Gorsuch and Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court, 200 circuit court judges, moves the embassy to Jerusalem, recognizes the Golan Heights, terminates the Iran deal, eliminates Qassam Soleimani and al-Baghdadi from the face of the earth who were killing Christians and killing innocent Americans, eliminates ISIS, is able to restrict the flow of child sex trafficking mm -hmm. in our country, 
which is a scourge, and the president has gone out of his way to eliminate that, build a robust economy, and actually give voice back to our middle class, I I believe that is much more consistent than defending, in fact, actually much more defensible. In fact, you should be proud of voting for that as a Christian. than The person that says they want more abortions in our country, younger, more radical justices that believe that church and salvation is not essential. Mm. They want to take away your first freedoms. They want to reinstate the Iran deal, close the embassy in Jerusalem, decommission the Golan Heights recognition. I could go on. Yeah. I think that's a pretty clear choice for Christians. Amen. I, I like what David, though I was trying to say is what David Barton said. Remember when Romney was running and said, I can't vote for a Mormon. And he <laughs> says, as long as Jesus' name is not on the ballot, you're always voting for the le- the least evil or the le- lesser, lesser of two evils. And so we have to that's realize right. that is that, like you said, we're not voting for a person as we're voting for policy. And Amen. like we always say, you, we, 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 you know, we don't say vote for Trump, even though I, I like, I, I don't do say that, that but I'll we kind of do, we do say it. <laughs> but I'm saying is, but we say vote for the person and people that you can vote for who rep- both re- best represent your biblical but values, also, uh, and that's our duty. Yeah, but also what we do say is that, like me personally, I don't see how you can be a Christian and even think about voting for Biden or Harris. I don't know how you can, if, especially if you believe in life and if you even just read the Bible. Like I think it's Proverbs uh or Psalm 139, if you just read that, like how you can't be convicted. And it says in James, I think 417, those who know what to do and don't do it. If you're listening to this right now, like you know what to do, like you know what to do. And I think it really comes down to apathy and just laziness, like people. And I think the importance too, we talk about it too, is actually going and voting, like not just the mail-in, but go out yeah. and vote. So what well, would you- Can you talk and, on that real quick? Yeah, I won't. Why is yeah, that so look, important? So you guys are in Arizona, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's an incredibly important battleground state. And I just, everyone watching this, please go vote for President Donald Trump. Please go vote Amen. for Senator Martha McSally. It's so important in the state of Arizona to please go do that in big numbers. And if you can, and you believe that if you've been to a grocery store, please go to a place to go physically vote. If yeah. you have not left your home because of medical reasons for any reason, then that, I get it. Then mm-hmm. do a mail and absentee ballot. Mm-hmm. But if you at least once a week are going somewhere physically, which is most people right now, studies are showing people are going to Walgreens, they're going to Walmart, they're going somewhere, then please go make, go do whatever you believe for protective measures. Go vote in person because do not trust, especially where you guys in Tucson, Maricopa counties. I still have questions about it, and I think that it's it's better than most states. But please go in person to go vote. Amen. It, it is your expression. You are the sovereign. We have been given this gift. We were given this gift that you we're actually in charge. You have a chance to go do it. It takes 12 minutes. Okay, you have a constitutional right to actually go vote. In my opinion, uh, a prerogative, I should say. Please go exercise that. Yeah. And if- so you would say even if we have a mail in, because I always get the mail in ballot because I'm busy. You would say well, take you that to the polling place. Go, yeah. go take it in. Yeah. And turn to the local county do not give it to the postal service is my point point. Okay. and then Amen. by the way if you're watching this and you get a mail-in ballot and you're like charlie i don't feel comfortable going to a polling place for medical reasons or whatever okay then have a friend go turn in the ballot for you mm. that you really trust that is kind of active right now right just no. hand it off to them and then have them because that's a legal way to do it do mm. not put it in the mail is my point whatever Amen. it takes do not put it in the mail they are Amen. finding thousands of ballots in parking lots right now that mm-hmm. are missing. Wow. And you remember, I mean, you're from Chicago. My family is like Italian mafia, but they said Sam Giacana. Have you ever heard of him? But the mafia guy. But they said the the Kennedy election was so close, and they say that's right. There's some rumors that he he rigged that because he said when he would, you know. So I mean, yeah. So if that happened back what 50 years ago, what's happening now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. This has been amazing, guys. I'd love to come speak to church. And we'll find a date. God bless you guys for being so bold. And let's make it big when I come. Let's try to do it for the election. Amen. 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 Bless well, thank you, you, Charlie. So much thank for you so us. much. It's out of Erica. Thank you so much for joining our conversation with Charlie Kirk. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you would like to listen to us wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. Also, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. Thanks so much, and God bless.